Lately, I've been daydreaming about 35,000-year-old cave paintings. Cavemen etched their accomplishments into cave walls, giving us the first stories we have from humans. At the time, this could only be shared with those visiting said cave. But now a caveman, or woman, with a camera phone could share their tale with millions. Our stories have always mattered, except now we're living in a time when they can be shared globally, instantly. I'm the content editor for a digital publishing company that showcases innovative philanthropy, and I'm obsessed with sharing cool stories. We create a website and digital magazines that focus on positivity as opposed to fear-based media. I also dropped out of college, wandered the West, read some books, and my mother still thinks I'm smart. <laughs> the world around us is changing so much so quickly, it's hard to tell where we're going anymore. Media and information have permeated every corner of our lives. We're incessantly devouring headlines and articles and stories, masses of people consuming massive amounts of content. It's hard to find the proper perspective on such drastic change. A couple years ago, I was unable to walk. I found myself trapped in bed with a computer. I was left alone with endless media and for the first time began to see how it really affected my outlook. I was deeply saddened to see so much negativity and fear in the news. It felt like every headline was death and disaster. It felt like all you could expect would be more of the same. It felt like even if I could get out of bed, it would be pointless. And then I wondered, how can I see so many hurting people and never feel the need to help them? In all this technology and madness, I felt desensitized. I had lost my empathy. The fact of the matter is, bad news is bad news. Now, I realize this just got real heavy and deep all at once. Please do your best to keep up. <laughs> Nearly every night, I fall asleep reading the news on my phone. A girl was just chopped up with a hatchet by her father. In the morning, I wake to my iPhone's odd robotic alarm and begin reading again. Terrorists are coming, they have the bomb, it won't be long. The TV sh screams across the room as I'm making breakfast. People are dying everywhere. Breaking news shot into my car as I'm driving to work. Riots, murder, death, suicide, rape, genocide, violence, inflation, greed, earthquakes, recession, tsunamis, drugs, hurricanes. We've lost Lindsay Lohan. Where's Lindsay Lohan? I miss her. <laughs> For all our modern day progression and advancement, where are the good stories? It seems to me we're focusing entirely on the problem, not the solution. We're only being told the beginning of the story. There's more going on in the world than just death, disaster, and Lady Gaga. But what is the rest of the story? Who's cleaning up these disasters? Who's counseling struggling broken families? Who's picking up the pieces of a broken world? The answer is people everywhere, every day. People are helping the hurting, the struggling, the needy, all around us, we're just not hearing about it. The Elemental Project was created for this very reason, to share the untold stories of everyday people lifting others up. Because frankly, we are tired of bad news. And because what we focus on affects what we do. First, we built a website and began researching local nonprofits and then posting articles about them online. Immediately, we were shocked to find so many that we had never heard of right around us. The more we dug, the more we found. The more we found, the more we realized that we wanted to share them with others. So we created more platforms to showcase giving, charity, and volunteering. We used a website, social media, and developed digital magazines to publicize the actions of individuals and organizations that are using their resources to fix problems worldwide. Honestly, in the beginning, we had no idea what we were doing. And it was really difficult because good news is hard to find. You actually have to hunt for it. Because in our culture, good news doesn't sell advertising. Fear does. But the more stories we shared and the more people we connected with, we began to find a need that we could fill. We realized that we could evolve into a bridge between individuals looking to get inspired and initiatives that need funding or manpower. We realized we could evolve into that bridge, and then we began connecting those with resources to those without them. Once we saw the power in becoming a facilitator, we were off and running, connecting an international aid group with truckloads of water to earthquake victims in Haiti helping a woman in England who had just lost her son in a tragic car accident get publicity for a nonprofit she was starting that counsels other hurting parents. A group in Texas saw a feature we did on low-cost baby incubators, bought hundreds, and decided to send them to Africa to save children there. A magazine feature on a man in D.C. who lost his job and decided to spend the next year of his life giving away his savings to complete strangers. 
At the time I found this last story, I myself was struggling to find a job. It resonated so strongly with me that I decided to go down to the city mission and volunteer for a day, as opposed to sitting home and whining about the economy. And that's the whole point of what we're trying to do. Share something that gets you up and out and into your community, as opposed to home and down and alone. There's this semi-creepy side effect that goes along with our rapid progression. It's becoming known as digital isolation. Our technology has freed us of boundaries. It's leveled the playing field. Anyone with access to the internet has access to the same overwhelming amount of information. It's hard to believe the things we can do on a phone now. Sometimes I like to think back on life before cell phones. In 10th grade, I thought my pager was super cool. <laughs> I was like, hey girl, page me. <laughs> now our entire lives are in these things. We're completely connected to everyone we know and we merely have to swipe a finger to do it. We can peer into every corner of the world while never leaving a chair. Our connectedness is incredible, almost immeasurable, and it's downright frightening that we no longer have to personally interact. When I was a kid, people would ask my mom, where's John? She'd say, I don't know, probably in a tree. Because I was. I spent my childhood climbing trees and chasing kids and running in the neighborhood. Now I see kids glued to tiny screens, playing games online for days. I meet lonely adults with severe social anxiety and depression. I see a world where iconic businesses and industries have vanished seemingly overnight. Change is causing mass hysteria, fear, and uncertainty. But our greatest strength as humans has always been the community we create around each other. Our ability to band together during life's tribulations. Our ability to love and care for our neighbors. But community isn't just a necessity for our neighbors, it's a necessity for us. We're wired for close personal relationships. There's an oft-forgotten universal truth that says, helping others is another way of helping ourselves. There's no escaping the fact that we're going to keep jamming technology into our lives. And frankly, I'm on board with that because I dig it. But it's so important to stay aware of the human element and keep challenging ourselves to interact personally. It's this personal interaction and act of giving that allows us to experience fuller, more joyful lives. As the world changes, so too must our community and our philanthropy. Our great-grandparents walked across the dirt road and said, Daryl, I know you've been having a hard time. Here's a goat. <laughs> our grandparents volunteered at soup kitchens. Our parents brought clothes to the mission. Now it's our turn, and we have all this new stuff to do it with. We're starting socially conscious businesses, fair trade establishments, one-for-one -one initiatives, Blogging against injustice, charity texting, crowdfunding, cash mobbing, we're using all our new toys as tools. My team and I believe that showcasing these campaigns is an awesome way to incite change because reading about someone helping overseas is nice, but reading about your friend who's helping in your neighborhood is powerful. That's how you combat isolation and loneliness and apathy. So the question then becomes, how can we, as individuals, do more good. Basically, I think it all comes down to what Spider-Man's uncle said. <laughs> Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Every one of us has a phenomenal amount of resources at our disposal, giving us the potential to impact thousands. I'll share a little bit of my personal story. I spent my 20s in Southern California running a small company. Mostly, I just partied a lot, traveled a lot, and met a ton of people. I didn't have a boss or schedule or coworkers. I woke up every day and did whatever I felt like doing. I probably would have kept on living like that had I not completely blown out a disc in my back. Suddenly, my freedom and independence were stripped from me. I had what you might call a special moment lying on the cold bathroom floor when my mother had to give me my first enema. <laughs> Humbling is one word you could use. <laughs> As I lay in bed, recovering from surgery, I was forced to look back on my life and reflect. I was a bit ashamed to see so many years spent in selfish indulgence. In a Percocet-induced haze, <laughs> I imagined Oprah and Dr. Phil having a baby. <laughs> I imagined this baby finding me, staring me in the face and saying, Jonathan, you can do more with your life. I had learned two very valuable lessons. One, you cannot run from Oprah's baby. <laughs> and two, 
what it feels like to be completely and utterly helpless. It's a feeling we as Americans don't experience too often. And so when I was back on my feet, I decided I wanted my life to have more purpose, to be more meaningful. The cool thing about opening yourself up to change is that if you seek it, it will find you. It wasn't long before I had sold everything I owned, jumped in a Ford truck, and drove 2,200 miles back to Michigan. I sought out a group of like-minded peers, and we started this project. This has been my modest attempt at giving back. There's a million things I can't do, but this is one thing I can. It's ironic because the idea was to inspire others, and I feel like really so many of these others have inspired me. We're really excited about the next phase of our project, which is giving you and the general public access to our site, so that you quite literally can begin spreading your own good news, so that you can start telling the world about the positive events happening around you. One of the things I love about living in West Michigan is the fostered mindset of giving and creative startups. People are available, willing to help, and ready to walk out new ventures. It's been a huge blessing to be here and be part of this community. My elemental partners have challenged me and allowed me to do more than I ever could have alone. And frankly, they're the real talent behind Elemental. We're not sitting here trying to shoot rainbows and skittles out of our rears with warm, fuzzy headlines. <laughs> we agree that there's great need and suffering in the world. We're just choosing to focus on what can be done. This planet is full of different people with different skills. If we all try to find simple ways to incorporate charity into our lives, there's no limit to what we can do. Never before has your time, your opinion, or your talent been more meaningful, been more valuable. You can share a single thought with thousands. From the 35,000-year-old cave paintings until now, every one of us leaves a mark. I strongly believe there are only two things we actually own during our short stay on this planet, this moment and our story. If we spend more moments helping others, we're going to leave behind incredible stories. Let's make some new headlines. Thank you. Thank you.